epilepticus is another entity within the seizure world which is undergoing refinements in its definitions. Historically, the definition for status epilepticus was a continuous seizure lasting more than 30 minutes since at that point in time there's likely to begin the development of actual cerebral damage. However, this is a very impractical definition because of uh, the risk to the patient of waiting around on that 29th minute thinking that there was no neurological emergency since they weren't in status, but oh, at 30 minutes we had to rapidly intervene. So uh, at this point in time we use an operational definition which states that if the seizure activity has been continual for five minutes despite intervention, then at that point that patient would be considered to be in status epilepticus. The pathophysiology of status epilepticus involves a mismatch between excitatory and inhibitory signals such that after about three to five minutes of continual seizing, there is an upregulation of the excitatory pathways and a downregulation of the inhibitory or gamma aminobutyric acid receptors, GABA receptors, which this process can be amplified by other areas of the brain, and in particular the temporal lobe will amplify this mismatch. Besides the clinically obvious generalized convulsive status epilepticus, some patients may have what's referred to as non-convulsive status epilepticus, in which their brain does show continual seizure activity, which may not actually have very obvious uh, physical manifestations. In fact, um, the terminology of EMD, electromechanical dissociation, is also used for the brain besides the heart, and it refers to the fact that there are very little or subtle movements in patients uh, because of an energy failure of the motor cortex. In fact, the pathophysiology of brain damage in status epilepticus has to do with this metabolic mismatch, and particularly after 20 to 30 minutes, the supply of glucose and oxygen simply cannot meet the metabolic demands and there is a marked increase in production of lactic acid, all of which produces a toxic environment and cerebral damage. So clinically the patients can present with an altered sensorium with fairly minimal um, motor activity manifestations, maybe some eye twitching or some muscle twitching, and um, the likelihood of developing non-convulsive status is related to your degree of alertness such that um, seizures are detected in only 6% of awake patients, 20% of lethargic, 25% of stuporous and up to one-third of comatose patients may actually be suffering from a non-convulsive status epilepticus. There may actually be a continuum of convulsive status to non-convulsive, again because its manifestations may be so subtle and it's been estimated that actually 37% of patients who have been treated for convulsive status continue to have electrographic seizures. The so-called RAMPART trial, rapid anticonvulsant medication prior to arrival trial, demonstrated that it was the time to treatment which was the best predictor of how the patient's going to respond to interventions to manage or treat their convulsive status epilepticus. Therefore, it's best to begin treatment out in the field. And this is usually done with a benzodiazepine, preferably midazolam, which can be administered intramuscularly so as to avoid the necessity for intravenous placement. But other patients have been given rectal valium, or buccal or intranasal um, 
midazolam, and that all works well. Now, once the patient has arrived at the hospital, the first line of treatment is to give lorazepam. Now, there is traditionally uh, underdosing of this because the actual recommended dose, as you can see, is 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram, which will make it about 7 or 8 milligrams in most patients. Whereas in the emergency room, because of concern over inducing respiratory insufficiency, the typical dose is going to be 2 or 3 milligrams, which is clearly not adequate, and gets in the way of your actual goal, which is to administer both the first line treatment and the anticonvulsant, certainly within an hour's time, to give the best chance at stopping the status epilepticus and avoiding any permanent brain damages, which can include loss of memory, brain atrophy, and abnormal signals seen in the mesial temple. As soon as the benzodiazepine has completed its infusion, it would behoove you to start the anticonvulsant phase or second line therapies any of the above listed anticonvulsants are perfectly acceptable, though, of course, the most clinical data has to do with the phosphenitoin, which, according to the Veterans Administration Cooperative Trial, worked about 44% of the time with phosphenitoin. But again, it is a weight-based dose. I think that emergency medicine people are drilled into their head that the dose of phosphenitoin or phenytoin dilantin is one gram, whereas it's 20 milligrams per kilogram. The advantage of phosphenitoin or phenytoin is that it can be given much more rapidly at 150 milligrams per minute as opposed to only 50 milligrams, and it doesn't have the potential cardiotoxic side effects of phenytoin. However, more recently, people are using Levetiracetam or Keppra at a dose of 2,000 milligrams BID or Lecosamide 200 milligrams infusion or IV Valproate which I've been using at a loading dose of 30 milligrams per kilogram and I know that it's an accurate dose if I get a phone call from the pharmacy telling me that that's much too high of a dose I know I'm in the uh, ball ballpark right figure if the management has gotten to the point where you've given the benzo and they failed the first anticonvulsant, it's probably time to go ahead and have the patient intubated and induce anesthesia. Uh, the goal there is to get the patient out of status epilepticus, uh, hopefully with an EEG monitoring, so that the endpoint is a burst suppression type pattern. Um, the medications most commonly used for this now are midazolam with an IV bolus and a continual drip or Versed. However, high-dose Versed may bring its own set of problems. Previously, we used pentobarbital, which is a short-acting barbiturate. However, it does take a long time for it to wear off. And so if you want to see if your patient has gotten out of status epilepticus after discontinuing the medication, uh, it's recommended that you use one of the first two drug regimens.